Hello, hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of the Daily Train Show. I'm your host, Nicholas Larma, and today I'm joined by Mr. Marius Root. Marius, how are you doing? How is the Fair East Rand this day? Uh, how's it, Nick? It's nice and sunny out here. Very good, very good. Um, and sunny Benoni, as the commercials used to describe it. <laughs> and of course, we also have Mr. Herman Pretorius, who I believe is in his uh, fortress in Pretoria somewhere, or his fiance's fortress, or, or something. Yeah, it's, it's something along those lines. But it's it's uh, the the fortress is actually the Fuertrecker monument. Um, it's got some really <laughs> impressive uh, railings that, at the press of a button, or just if you yell the name of Paul Kruger, that the, these things just activate. And what people don't know is the Fuertrecker monument is actually a Mars spaceship that you can launch alongside the formerly no. named John Forster Tower, and you can just move the Afrikaner to Mars. So, everyone, I have to mute today, I'm on I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, people don't want to hear the truth. They don't want to hear the truth, Marius. It's, what, it's, how, much, how much did Bill Gates pay you, Marius? How much? <laughs> it's the ultimate trick, I suppose. Um, anyway. Yes. Uh, Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> the final frontier and all that. <laughs> Let us move past uh, uh, flights of fancy, however, to the the shocking discovery that the South African government has a rabid right wing free marketeer libertarian in its highest levels of power. Well, not really, uh, not even close, but still. Um, South African Reserve Bank Governor Lesejo Kanyaho uh, uh, said. Um, something that I think has been quoted by people in the free market sphere for a really long time, which is that there's no such thing as a free lunch. Uh, he was he was talking uh, recently to the media uh, during a webinar um, hosted by the CDE, which said that, uh, where, where he said several things needed to be taken into consideration by politicians, namely that trade-offs were necessary to avoid a debt hangover, which coming generations would pay for, um, that when we make choices as a society, we cannot allow the excesses and the desires of this generation to be at the expense of generations that come after us. So what has been happening is the generation of today makes choices that all sound like it benefits us for now and leave the generations behind us with a massive debt burden. We call that generational inequality. Um, he said that uh, spending on consumption instead of infrastructure left nothing behind for those who inherited the debt. And then he went on to say, and so our task as tech technocrats, as economists, is to help frame those trade-offs so that the political leadership of this country can make decisions and they've got to understand that there is no free lunch. Very, uh, very good, sober um, warnings, I think, from the Reserve Bank governor there. Uh, Herman, what do you make of it? No, I think that's exactly right. And um, sorry, I mean to say that's exactly far right. Because anyone uh, holding that position these days would be seen as so far to the right um, that, that, you know, you won't be able to see your left hand. Uh, and, and ironically, this is pretty close to where Trevor Manuel was um, as Minister of Finance. We, we, we shouldn't forget um, that South Africa ra ran a, a budget surplus um, 13 years after 1994. And if you take into account what the awful position the South African Fiskers was in after the 70s and the 80s when the boom of the 60s had cooled off and when the um, you know, massive military and state uh, uh, militarization of the state spending of the 1980s uh, uh, you know, caught up with South Africa, um, they were, the, the Fiskers was essentially uh, depleted in, in many ways when, when the ANC came into government. And Trevor Manuel then managed to change um, that into a surplus. Um, and, and, you know, it, it might sound esoteric and not very important, but what, what just having this idea of living within your means is so fundamentally uh, uh, obvious that we as individuals do it. 
uh, businesses do it. The, the best advice you can ever give someone is if you're in debt, get out of it as quickly as possible because debt interest is coming to eat your children. Now, the problem is once you say this in the context of South Africa's government, you are immediately placing yourself in an ideological minority in the South African political conversation, at least that is reported on in the media, because you've got this bizarre idea that the state can get money from nowhere. And that's just fundamentally misunderstanding what the point of money is. In its very basest form, it is supposed to be the manifestation of subjective value in an objective measurement. So you look at where a government can get money. That means it needs to get something of value. So you cannot just print money, have quantitative easing, modern monetary theory until the cows come home, which is, you know, drip, uh, drip feeding into uh, even the thinking of the presidency. So for Kanyaho to come out and say this is incredibly important, incredibly brave. But the real sad thing is he is one voice amongst many idiots calling for sanity. Um, it is quite clear that a government has five sources of income, taxation quantitative easing or money printing, borrowing, the seizure of assets, or the cutting of expenditure. And the problem is what Han Yaho is actually arguing for here, if you read beneath, between the lines, is that living within your means is the only thing left. We can't borrow. Our credit rating is, you know, uh, subjunct status. We can't tax. The South African tax base is uh, you know, starved for any form of realistic money retention hope. We can't seize assets, but that's where EWC and NHI and prescribed assets come from. And you can't print money because then you trigger the inflation that will be essentially just taxing by stealth, destroying the savings of South Africans for the government to get their hands on some cash. So Han Yaho is really on the money here, and, the, and no pun intended, uh, but the problem is that his thinking, as long as he's there, I think there's some hope for the Reserve Bank to fight for its independence. My real fear comes as to who succeeds him, because as long as the Reserve Bank controls the money supply and has someone like him there, I think we've got some some uh, bolstrades against the hyperinflation threat that has consumed Argentina, that has consumed Venezuela, and that has consumed Zimbabwe. It is an incredibly dangerous road. And the fact that common sense is now rare really says a lot about how we've allowed our politics through either stupidity, apathy, or inaction to decline so far from sense that should be common. So I think the sign of an institution that's strong is when it shapes the individuals who pass through it rather than um, uh, being entirely shaped by the individuals in it. Uh, obviously, there's there's always a little bit of both, but um, I think it's worth noting that I think the the the, the uh, Reserve Bank is one of the strong institutions in South Africa that it, that is keeping the ship afloat, and you can see that by the way that people go into the Reserve Bank. I mean, uh, we had. Of course, Tito Mbueni, um, a man behind our, our destructive labor laws, uh, which we might get onto just now. And he goes through the Reserve Bank and he comes out with a much more sen uh, sensible, pragmatic and conservative approach to fiscal policy. Um, and, and I think that says something about the, the goodness of the institution. Not that I want to take anything away from the current Reserve Bank governor. Um, Kanyaho is, uh, I think, uh, is, is a good dude. Um, but, uh, Maurice, what do you make of the role of the Reserve Bank in, in, in defending our economy? And, it, and it, it's worth noting that considering the sort of internal political and ideological climate within government, that to say something as sort of sensible as this really takes a lot of guts to swim against the, the tide. Well, there's a couple of initial points I want to make. Uh, Harriman said, uh, uh, I, I want to push back some of the things Harriman said. He said, we can't tax the taxpayer anymore and we can't print money. I need to break it to you, Harriman. The government definitely can, and that is what's obviously got to be, what we've got to stand against. I think that's what Khamiaf was trying to do. But I also want to say there's uh, some things that I never thought I'd ever see in my life, and one of them Wait, can, can, is, can I add a point of nuance there? We can tax the taxpayer more. We're just not going to make a lot of money out of it. Yeah. yeah. And even yeah. And the problem is even if we had to increase the, uh, the amount of tax each individual pays in South Africa, it probably still won't actually help much because we are losing tax rate, uh, taxpayers at an alarming rate. 
So mm. it doesn't matter. We can we can raise a tax. You know, for every single person in South Africa can pay sixty percent of the income tax, and we actually make that much of a difference. And also, uh, it's um, one thing I never thought I'd see is that a South African government official would use a, a phrase beloved of libertarians, which is there yes. is no such thing as a free lunch, which Robert Heinlein, the famous science fiction author, loved to say, and Milton Friedman. So it tells you something. Maybe who knows? Maybe Khaniacho is a secret libertarian. I don't think so. I mean, he, he he sounds about a few tequila shops away from saying taxation is theft. Exactly. He probably does after he's had a couple of whiskeys around with all his friends. I don't know. With but, Tito, uh, and then Tito goes and tweets yeah, about exactly. sardines and garlic. Yeah, and yeah, and says something silly. Who knows? But yeah, but uh, the Reserve Bank is it's obviously an uh, important um, institution in South Africa, and it's one of those that's really held the line against some of the excesses. I mean, during the Zuma years, it was really stood strong and standing strong now. And Khaniacho, he's uh, when when uh, there, were, uh, there was talk about a new finance minister when the rumors first started about Tito Mboweni maybe standing down. Khaniacho was a name that was floated. And I think uh, he'd be an excellent finance minister, but uh, I don't know. I don't know his background too well, so I'm not sure if he's an ANC guy, you know. Uh, mm. But yeah. I don't know if he'd how he'd be able to hold the line against the ideology. I mean, he's done excellently in the uh, within the Reserve Bank, but I don't know if he'd be able to do the same thing within Cabinet. And I don't know, apart from Khaniacho, I mean, I'm not sure... Gordon Guana said some kind of positive things, but no, apart from that, if there's anybody who's in the cabinet or up in the NC who's actually worried about fiscal spending and who doesn't think that we can just go right. kind of just start printing money and start taxing people. And just, that's one thing that I think that should terrify all of us. Is there an Ace Magashile was still, when he just, be, or I'm, I can't remember if he just become Secretary General, but he would be Secretary General for a couple of months. And his office released a press statement saying that, uh, you know, we don't have to worry about all, you know, paying debts. The government can just pay itself for this thing called quantity easing. They didn't even get yes. the term right. So that tells you kind of the caliber of people who might, who like are trying to influence monetary policy in South Africa. So thank goodness we have somebody like Lesetia Kanyaho. And let's hope, uh, I'm not sure how long his term is, but let's hope he manages to uh, carry on, you know, holding the line. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. As long as that institution is strong and as long as it doesn't get gutted, like so many of our other institutions have been, um, it will it, it will be one of the things that gives South Africa a fighting chance to uh, get out of the mess that it's currently in. Uh, right, let's move swiftly along to a story I don't think we'll spend an enormous amount of time on, but it's still worth pointing out, which is that the country's largest trade union federation is, and perhaps this says more about me than about uh, the union and reporting all this but they're having a national day of action today which i didn't know about until this morning um and they have asked their uh 1.8 member uh, 1.8 million members to stay home from work um or join them for one of their marches uh, i think there's two one in uh, cape town and one in johannesburg and uh, these protests are against corruption retrenchments and the country's high unemployment rate. Um, right. Kasatu is striking against <laughs> unemployment. Um, Morris, do you want to maybe take this one? What, what can you say? You just kind of roll your eyes and laugh, maybe. <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's mind boggling. You know, the country's, the economy's already on its knees. And, you know, and let's, Let's uh, kill some more productivity by getting uh, a whole bunch of people to not come uh, come to work and so on. And we already see uh, Nums has uh, embarked on a strike, and I've seen some footage of uh, you know some violence uh, down in Durban. They broke uh, down the um, gate of a company. There are rumours of uh, strikers in Boxburg shooting at police. So you know it's strike season kind of again in South Africa, but uh, yeah, it's, yeah, but. Uh, it's also Kusatu, it's it's actually mind boggling. They, they I think they, they're also like a lot of people in South Africa who kind of uh, sort of can can see the issues with race based policy and it's almost on the tip of their tongue and they can almost say this is what's wrong. I think Kusatu is often also there. They they can they they know actually what the problems are, but they just can't bring themselves to say, Well, actually these are the issues. You know, there's too much state involvement. Obviously not the you know, I'm sure a lot of people in Kusato are ideologues, but I think just sometimes they, they're almost at the point of saying, yes, okay, this is the problems with, these are the problems with South Africa. And one of them is, you know, 
we, we can't get you, you can't just say at the drop of hat two million people need to go on strike. That's not exactly going to be good for the economy. Um, I just want to say a quick shout out to Gabriel, one of our usual contributors, who's watching us on Facebook. Um, so hi to him, and uh, yeah, check out his comment. He made a made a really good one. Um, <laughs> I see. Well, someone in the comments is saying that Herman is itching to get into this topic. Uh, so, Herman, let rip. Well, um, yeah, well, I, the, the real problem is that there's a, there's an economic insight deficit as wide as the gap between Irvin Jim's two front teeth. Is uh, Unemployment isn't something you can protest against. Uh, un- a job is created when the right circumstances are there for a job, when you've got a discernible need that can be identified, can be solved, can be, you know, uh, 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 satisfied. Um, and when there is uh, a sufficient capital for the person interested in that need being met um, to compensate the person meeting that need uh, with, with, with a fair wage, I mean, or with a, with a fair exchange money. That's, that's where a job comes from. Um, it, it, and, and thinking back as to, uh, to Ace Magashule's time, uh, you know, at the, at the head of the ANC, he also at one point said that the NEC of the ANC had decided, decided that they will bring unemployment down to 17%. Well, um, first things first is why 17, you cruel bastard, if it's possible to just decide to bring unemployment down, why, I mean, why leave a few million people hanging? evil uh, man. But the problem is also that you can't decide that. You, it, it, it's just as you can't promote, um, uh, I mean, it, it's something like unemployment, you know, we, we're going to do nothing until you go down. You, you can't legislate businesses into success. You can't legislate people into jobs. You can't legislate people out of poverty. And the real problem here is that we've, Kusatu is buying into this magic of protest action. Um, I have long thought that there was this 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 idea that the protest actions of the late '80s and early '90s, actually by the from the unions' perspective, were seen as the magic bullets that ended apartheid. And and if you if you you know want to know what actually ended apartheid, go read Anthea Jeffrey's People's War. But I think there's been, there's this mythologizing of protest action within the union movement that it can solve anything. If I mean the, the ANC once marched on itself um, to change its own policy, um, and we we, we uh, face this. It situ- does that actually relatively often? Um, yes, I'm, I mean if, even if you think about it, Kasata being part of the tripartite alliance at least is is now you know striking against their alliance partner. So the problem here is that there's a fundamental misunderstanding in the elite leadership of Kasatu as to where jobs actually come from and why jobs actually can be sustained or created or lost in this case. So when Kasatu, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's like really protesting weather um, in, in, in the sense it is absolutely moronic. And the real sad thing is the unions are sowing, because I'm, I'm, broadly anti-trade union, but I think there's a definite role for trade unions to play. Trade unions have historically, at least if you look back to the Industrial Revolution, made life for workers better. Um, it, it, it improved capitalism for workers to have a voice and to stand up against you know, really cruel, inhumane, exploitative practices. That was a good thing. So unions really have a positive contribution to make. But the problem here is the unions are tragically uh, hastening their own spectacular irrelevance by just uh, simple mathematics. If if you're a member of a union, that means you've got a job. If joblessness increases, union membership decreases. So these people have a fundamental ideological inability to see what really creates jobs and what destroys them, to, to strike against unemployment and retrenchments. I, I mean, to protest against Corrupt. That's that's perhaps one thing. That is, there's a specific decision making that you can convince differently. But to strike against unemployment and retrenchment, what and in so doing, putting further strain on the productive sectors of our economy, still brave enough to uh, you know have the guts to employ people and try to keep their doors open and not just you know give up and go overseas. I, I mean, really, it's 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 as comprehensible as an Irving Jim tweet. I think You're I'm like still... a... sorry. Sorry, you were like a Beyblade there. We just let you rip and you spun all out all over the place. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I think the uh, points uh, with um, unions, what Herman uh, was saying, 
Hammer, um, Hammers, unions, obviously, I think they can often be a force for good, but in South Africa, I think there's such adversary, adversarial relationship between uh, business and unions on the one side. It's, the, it's not a, you know, symbiotic relationship. It's a very adversarial one. And I think that's why we have this kind of thing. You know, no, I'm sure no business wants to, they don't enjoy firing people, you know, and it's, uh, and same with uni the unions and businesses need to work together to protect jobs and so on. But I mean, the way society sometimes behaves and obviously also labor laws in our country, it's, you know, it makes it more difficult for people to, to it makes a lot of people who want to employ because of our various relations and um, various laws and so on. And yeah, it's, uh, and I think the, uh, I think that's one thing that needs to reset in South Africa is the relationship between unions and uh, mm -hmm. businesses and business owners and so on. Yeah, Kasatu having a march against unemployment feels a little bit like a drug lord showing up to an anti-drugs march. Um, or well, it's like when the joint... ANC marches against the ANC. When the yeah. you know, ANC Khateng marches against the National ANC to the Tuli House because of lack of service delivery or something. Or whatever the case is. It, it kind of kind of reminds me of that meme of the two Spider-Men pointing at each other. Exactly, Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, okay, let us move on from that to um, Zama Zamas. So, of course, um, uh, many people know that Zama Zama refers to an illegal miner in South Africa. Uh, and, of course, being such a mineral-rich place, there's quite a lot of uh, mining that goes on, often without government license. Um, so, in some, you know, I think we'd argue that the license regime in South Africa's mining sector is not great. Unfortunately, a lot of the uh, illegal miners are really kind of more like sort of mafioso organizations. Um, they're accused in some cases of using basically slave labor. They often engage in gun battles with each other, sometimes underground, which is just like something out of a fiction novel. Um, and recently, uh, they've been in the news in the northwest town of Orkney. Six people were shot dead and 30 were arrested after a group of apparently 300 Zama Zamas attempted to deliver uh, food supplies to another group who were underground and they were stopped by security, private security and police. A gun battle ensued in which six people were killed and, uh, as I said, 30 were arrested. And this is not anything new. Uh, in fact, if you drive around parts of Johannesburg, you will find illegal mining operations often out in the open. Um, uh, I've, I've seen them as there's, there's uh, operations of people refining metals basically out in the open, um, just on the edges of Soweto. Um, I've, I, I've talked to uh, women who were washing gravel to try and find gold specks in it, also on the outskirts of Soweto. Um, Morris, you've also seen big Zama Zama operations uh, in areas that you've traveled through recently. I wouldn't say they're big, but uh, I was in Pilgrim's Rest uh, over one weekend. And uh, you can see sometimes the Zama Zamas wandering around. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've also heard from the people who live there that you can see them, you know, going about their business and washing their clothes. And uh, they apparently, uh, they do a lot of business with the... Uh, um, you know, parts of the town and Pilgrim's Rest there, they go buy their supplies and stuff. And there's pretty much a blind eye turn to uh, what the guys get up to. But uh, as we were saying before the show, uh, you know, this is a failure of policy and the government. I'm pretty sure most Zama Zamas would much rather be, you know, maybe they, they'd like to be miners, but they'd like to be working for a proper company with benefits, get wages, not live in very dangerous conditions. You know, even apart from, you know, being a Zama Zama, you might get shot and killed. You know, obviously, there, I'm sure this is obviously something we're not going to hear about, but I'm sure there are lots of accidents, rock falls, and whatever that right. kills them. Uh, uh, so, and one of the reasons for that is they're often mining in old mine shafts mm -hmm. where most mm -hmm. of the ore that's left over is in the support beams. And so you have to mine the support beams for the shaft in order to get the best stuff. And of course, that has fairly predictable consequences. So, I mean, this is a combination of um, yeah, failure of policy, failure to uh, create jobs and so on. But at the same time, artisanal mining, which is like these kind of small scale miners, it's something that can actually be harnessed. Uh, somebody was telling me about the issue in Bolivia where there, their artisanal miners actually sell what they have to a formal refinery. And then the government, uh, and then the, the company uh, buys the, the ore from them and so on. And then the government gets, gets taxed on it. They, uh, I mean, the, the money gets taxed, the government gets money from it. And these artisanal miners are part of the formal economy and so on. So we've got to look for, uh, you know, innovative solutions to this kind of thing but you know 
I don't think uh, the South African government's ever made a solution of blacks. You know, it's, only ever, it's, it's never made a problem with dislikes. So, yeah, so uh, and, um, I think Harriman's got an invisible ghost there or something. Yeah, he's, he's, popping around he's his, got the hammering his, going on next to him. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> hang on. Hang on. My dog is being ill. Oh, okay. um, oh that's I, um, dog noises. Yeah, right, sorry. No, no. I'll, I'll, I've got to go. Okay, sure. Cheers. So, okay. <laughs> so Hammond's yeah, right. got a, a dog issue. Yeah, so I mean, the Zama Zama issue, it's something that's not going to go away. And that's something that also, you know, people like that kind of, whatever we can do to bring them into the formal economy. And exactly as David says there, and, you know, obviously the Zama Zamas are not doing things the right way, but can you blame them in an economy where we've basically got 50% unemployment, you know, a lot of people... You know, it's easy to point fingers at guys like that, but they're also just trying to make a living and put food on the table. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. Uh, of course, though, like so many things in South Africa, it's also a bit of a policing failure often. Um, uh, you know, very often these guys, they're not really tackled at all. And I mean, it's sometimes I guess it's because the police are scared of them. I mean, mm. uh, the, the you know, the serious money in these operations. And so the Zamazamas are often quite heavily armed. And so I'd, I'd too be a bit worried about trying to go shut them down um as this uh, case that we started with kind of points out right i mean 300 people some of them armed and a massive mm -hmm. gun battle ensuing that's it's like crazy sort of wild west stuff um but one does feel like you know more could be done in the policing side of things uh to 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 try and roll this back and of course the the other issue um and we sort of brushed on it here is that because these Mining operations are often happening in old mines and sort of without much, um, shall we say, planning, because they're kind of a bit ad hoc. Uh, we we are in danger of suffering big threats to infrastructure. Um, mm. There are highways around Gauteng, which I think are probably in danger of structural damage because Amazonas are mining underneath them. Anyway. Well, um, that's, uh, that's also one of South Africa's great problems is... Uh, Infrastructure. I think Mark Schussler, actually, uh, an economist that probably a lot of our listeners will know quite well and our, our viewers. We, we talked uh, about him yesterday on the show. Yeah, I mean, he, he uh, shared an a interesting graph showing uh, how uh, South Africa was soon going to get to a point where more infrastructure was getting destroyed than was being created. And that is, the, that is one of the ma major signs of a failing, if not a failed state, where more, you know, you actually start to lose an infrastructure. And that's, that's what happens. I mean, I'm sure a country like Zimbabwe has. I, I was actually reading the uh, DRC is actually one of the few countries in the world which now has uh, less, uh, as fewer kilometers of roads now than did 20, uh, 20 years ago. And I wouldn't be surprised um, if South Africa might start reaching that point fairly soon. Maybe not with roads, but other uh, kind of infrastructure. Certainly with railways. We certainly have uh, far less railway infrastructure than we did even. Oh yeah, no, we we're, <laughs> we're definitely there with rails, um, considering. Mm -hmm. uh, if you, uh, I think the Daily Maverick actually did an investigative report on this, uh, what is it, a year or two ago, about the incredible amount of theft going on um, of, of our rail infrastructure. But anyway, to finish off today, uh, let's very briefly just talk about something that's quite good news, um, which is that the World Health Organization, compromised as it is, recommended that uh, children in sub-Saharan Africa should... Um, receive the world's first malaria vaccine uh, so this vaccine has been in development and has been trialed over the last year or so and it has found to significantly reduce the chances of severe disease or death for people who get malaria so it doesn't prevent you from getting it but it makes you far less likely to die and of course this is still a serious problem in many parts of the world particularly in africa where something like 400,000 people die every single year um, from malaria, uh, mostly mostly children. And uh, malaria is it's still quite a killer, especially if it's not very well treated, as it isn't in a lot of these uh, very poor places, places like the Congo or Uganda, um, where it can kill something like 30% of the people who are infected with it. So it's pretty hectic stuff. Uh, Maurice, what do you make of this? Yeah, well, um, it's, it's a nice piece of good news, and I think it'll, uh, um, yeah, when, whenever we come to a point where we're uh, doing well, where we're actually beating disease, uh, it's something to celebrate, and I think uh, humanity probably needed some 
good news in the last uh, last year or two. Uh, he's not looking that great. If we look at the bigger picture, we probably can see World War Three in uh, the South China Sea in the next uh, five years or so. So yeah, but this is obviously good news. And yeah, this is uh, this is also good for developments. Uh, you, know, it's, you can look at any kind of indicator. If fewer kids get sick, they have better, um, you know, if they don't suffer from endemic diseases as much, they have better outcomes with education. They, uh, you know, uh, better, um, uh, they're not uh, well, uh, they're not malnourished and so on. So there's obviously something to celebrate and it's great that the who's actually doing something uh, that we can maybe be proud of. So we're going to see. Yeah, well, <laughs> although at the end of the day, it's going to be up to the people on the ground to kind of hand out these things and and fund them and all that. But uh, yeah, that's, that's under, I guess, the next phase of the problem. Anyway, um, that's all the time we have for today. Uh, and uh, I uh, hope that you enjoyed the show. I um, hope that Herman's dog is all right. And we will see you next week for another episode of The Daily Friend Show. Have the most wonderful one, everyone. Cheers.